Naming of cats. The naming of cats is a difficult matter. It isn't just one of your holiday games. You may think at first I'm mad as a hatter. When I tell you a cat must have three different names. First of all, there's the name that the family uses daily, such as Peter, Augustus, Alonzo, or James, such as Victor, or Jonathan, George, or Bill Bailey. All of them are sensible, everyday names. They are fancier names if you think they sound sweeter. Some for gentlemen, some for the dames. Such as Pleo, Admetus, Electra, Demeter. But all of them sensible everyday names. But I tell you, a cat needs a name that's particular. A name that's peculiar and more dignified. Else how can he keep up his tail perpendicular? Or spread out his whiskers, cherish his pride. Of names of this kind, I can give you a quorum. Such as Munkastrep. Quaxo or Coricopat, such as Bambalorina or else Jelly Lorum, names that never belong to more than one cat, but above and beyond, there's still one name left over. That is the name that you will never guess, the name that no human research can discover, but the cat himself knows and will never confess. When you notice the cat in profound meditation, the reason I tell you is always the same, his mind is engaged in a rapt contemplation of the thought of the thought of the thought of his name, his ineff ineffable, eff effable, ineff ineffable, deep and inscrutable singular name. The Old Gumby Cat I have a Gumby Cat in mind. Her name is Jenny Any Dots. Her coat is of the tabby kind. Tiger stripes and leopard spots. All day she sits upon the stair, or on the steps, or on the mat. She sits and sits and sits and sits, and that's what makes a Gumby Cat. But when the day's hustle and bustle is done, then the Gumby Cat's work is but hardly begun. And when all the family's in bed and is tucks up her skirts to the basement, she is deeply concerned with the ways of the mice. Their behavior's not good, and their manners not nice. So when she has got them lined up on the matting, she teaches them music, crocheting, and tatting. I have a Gumby cat in mind. Her name is Jenny Any Dots. Her equal be, be hard to find. She likes the warm and sunny spots. All day she sits beside the hearth or on the bed or on my hat. She sits and sits and sits and sits, and that's what makes a Gumby cat. But when the day's hustle and bustle is done, then the Gumby's cat's work is but, but hardly begun, as she finds that the mice will not ever keep quiet, she is sure it is due to a regular diet, and believing that nothing is done without trying, she sets right to work with her baking and frying. She makes them a mouse cake of bread and dried peas, and a beautiful fry of lean bacon and cheese. I have a Gumby cat in mind. Her name is Jenny Any Dots. The curtain cord she likes to wind and tie into sailor knots. She sits up the window sill, anything that's smooth and flat. She sits and sits and sits and sits. That's what makes a Gumby cat. But when the day's hustle and bustle is done, then the Gumby cat's work is but hardly begun. She thinks that the cockroaches just need employment to prevent them from idle and wanton destroyment. So she's formed from the lot of disorderly louts, a troop of well-disciplined, helpful boy scouts. With a purpose in life and a good deed to do, and she's even created a beetle's tattoo. So for old Gumby cats, let us now give three cheers. On whom well-ordered households depend, it appears. It's good. Growl Tiger's last stand. Growl Tiger was a bravo cat who traveled on a barge. In fact, he was the roughest cat that ever roamed at large. From Gravesend up to Oxford, he pursued his evil aims, rejoicing in his title of the Terror of the Thames. His manner and appearance did not calculate to please. His coat was torn and seedy. It was baggy at the, his was baggy at the knees. One ear was somewhat missing. No need to tell you why. And he scaled up a hostile world from one forbidding eye. The cottagers of Rotherhith knew something of his fame. At Hammersmith and P Putney, people shuddered at his fame. At his name, they would fortify the hen house, lock up the silly goose. When the rumor ran along the shore, 
growl tigers on the loose. Woe to the weak canary that fluttered from its cage. Woe to the pampered Pekingese, face growl tiger's rage. Woe to the bristly bandicoot that lurks on foreign ships. And woe to any cat with whom growl tiger came to grips. But most to cats of foreign race his hatred ha had been vowed. To cats of foreign name and, and race no quarter was allowed. The Persian and the Siamese regarded him with fear, because it was a Siamese had mauled his missing ear. Now on a peaceful summer night all nature seemed at play. The tender moon was shining bright, the barge at Mulsk Bay lay. All in the balmy moonlit lay rocking on the tide, and Growl Tiger was exposed show his sentimental side, his bucko mate, Grumbuskin, long since had disappeared, or, the, or to the bell at Hampton he had gone to wet his beard, and his bosun, Tumble, Tumble Brutus, he too had stolen away, the yard behind the lion, prowling for his prey, in the forepeak of the vessel growl tiger sat alone, concentrating, concentrating his attention on the Lady Griddlebone, and his wretched crew were sleeping in the barrels and their bunks, as the Siamese came creeping in their sampans and their junks. Growl Tiger had no eye or, or ear for aught but Griddlebone. The lady seemed enraptured by his manly baritone, disposed to relaxation and awaiting no surprise, but the moonlight shone reflected from a thousand bright blue eyes. Closer still and closer the sampan circled round, and yet from all the enemy there was not heard a sound. The lovers sang their last duet, in danger of their lives, for the foe was armed with toasting forks and cruel carving knives. Then Gilbert gave the signal to his fierce Mongolian horde, the frightful burst of fireworks. Yet say that word, they swarmed aboard, abandoning their sampans and their pullet ways and junks, they battened down the hatches on the crew within their bunks. Then Griddlebone she gave a screech, for she was badly scared, I'm sorry to admit, but she quickly disappeared. She probably escaped with ease, I'm sure she was not drowned. But a serried ring of flashing steel, Growl Tiger did surround. The ruthless foe pressed forward, stubborn rank on rank. Growl Tiger, to his vast surprise, was forced to walk the plank. He who a hundred victims had driven to that drop, at the end of all his cries, was, was forced to go kerflip kerflop. On their way, on there was joy in whopping when the news fell through the land. At Maidenhead and Henley there was dancing on the strand. Rats were roasted whole at Brentford and Victoria Dock, and a day of celebration was demanded in Bangkok. The rum, the rum tum tiger, or bleh, excuse me, the rum tum tugger. The rum tum tugger is a curious cat. You offer him pheasant, he would rather have a grouse. You put him in a house, he would, he would much prefer a flat. Put him in a flat, then he'd rather have a house. You set him on a mouse, then he'd only want a rat. Set him on a rat, then he'd only he'd rather chase a mouse. Yes, the rum tum tugger is a curious cat. And there isn't any call for me to shout it, for he will do as he will do as he do do, and there's no doing anything about it. The rum tum tugger is a terrible bore. When you let him in, then he wants to be out. He's always on the wrong side of every door, and as soon as he's home, then he'd like to get about. He likes to lie in the bureau drawer, but he makes such a fuss if he can't get out. Yes, the rum tum tugger is a curious cat, and it isn't any use for you to doubt it. For he will do as he do do, and there's no doing anything about it. The rum tum tugger is a curious beast. His disobliging ways are a matter of habit. If you offer him fish, then he will always want a feast. When there isn't any fish, then he won't eat rabbit. If you offer him cream, then he sniffs and sneers, for he only likes what he finds for himself. So you'll only catch him in it right up to the ears. You put him away on the larder shelf. The rum tum tugger is artful and knowing. The rum tum tugger doesn't care for a cuddle, for he'll leap on your lap in the middle of your sewing, for there's nothing he enjoys like a horrible muddle. 
Yes, the Rum Tum Tugger is a curious cat, and there isn't any need for me to spout it, for he will do as he do do, and there's no doing anything about it. The Song of the Jellicles Jellicle cats come out tonight, Jellicle cats come one come all, The Jellicle moon is shining bright, Jellicles come to the Jellicle ball. Jellicle cats are black and white, Jellicle cats are rather small, Jellicle cats are merry and bright, And pleasant to hear when they caterwaul. Jellicle cats have cheerful faces, Jellicle cats have bright black eyes, They like to practice their airs and graces, And wait for the Jellicle moon to rise. Jellicle cats develop slowly, Jellicle cats are not too big, Jellicle cats are roly-poly, They know how to dance, at vote and jig. Until the Jellicle moon appears, They make their toilet and take their repose. Jellicles wash behind their ears, Jellicles dry between their toes. Jellicle cats are white and black, Jellicle cats are of moderate size. Jellicles jump like a jumping jack, Jellicle cats have moonlit eyes. They're quiet enough in the morning hours, they're quiet enough in the afternoon, preserving their terpiscorian powers to dance by the light of the Jellicle moon. Jellicle cats are black and white. Jellicle cats, as I said, are small. If it happens to be a stormy night, they will practice a caper or two in the hall. If it happens in the sun is shining bright, you would, you would say they had nothing to do at all. They are resting and saving themselves to be right, for the Jellicle Moon and the Jellicle Ball. Mungo Jerry and Rumpel Teaser Mungo Jerry and Rumpel Teaser were a very notorious couple of cats, as knockabout clowns, quick change comedians, tightrope walkers, and acrobats. They had an extensive reputation. They made their home in Victoria Grove. There was merely their center of operation, for they were incurably given to rove. They were very well known in Cornwall Gardens, in Lauciston Place, and in Kensington Square. They had really a little more reputation than a couple of cats can very well bear. The area window was found ajar, and the basement looked like a field of war. A tile or two came loose on the roof, presently ceased to be waterproof. If the drawers were pulled out from the bedroom chests, and you couldn't find one of your winter vests. Or after supper one of the girls suddenly missed her Woolworth, Woolworth pearls, then the family would say it's that horrible cat, it was Mungo Jerry or Rumpel Teaser, and most of the time they left it at that. Mungo Jerry and Rumpel Teaser had a very unusual gift of the gab. They were highly efficient cat burglars as well, and remarkably smart at a smash and grab. They made their home in Victoria Grove. They had no regular occupation. They were plausible fellows, and likely to gauge a friendly policeman in conversation. When the family assembled for Sunday dinner, their minds made up that they wouldn't get thinner on Argentine joint potatoes and greens, and the cook would appear from behind the scenes and say in a voice that was broken with sorrow, I'm afraid you must wait and have dinner tomorrow, for the joint has gone from the oven like that. The family say, it's that horrible cat. It was Mungo Jerry, or Rumple Teaser, and most of the time they left it at that. Mungo Jerry and Rumple Teaser had a wonderful way of working together, and some of the time you would say it was luck, some of the time you would say it was weather. They would go through the house like a hurricane, and no sober person would take his oath. Was it Mungo Jerry or Rumple Teaser, or could you have sworn that it might be both? When you heard a dining room smash, or up from the pantry there came a loud crash, or down from the, li from the library there came a loud ping from a vase which was commonly said to be Ming, then the family would say, now which was which cat? It was Mungo Jerry and Rumple Teaser, and there's nothing at all to be done about that. Hacking. All right. It's decided it wasn't.
Okay, hold on a second. Okay, I'm back. Before I forget, you know, if you happen to be awake, please don't fall asleep while in a weird position. I don't want you to hurt your... have a hurt back again. On my account. Ah, uh, alright. Old Deuteronomy. Old Deuteronomy has lived a long time. The cat who has lived many lives in succession. He was famous in proverb and famous in rhyme. A long while before Queen Victoria's asc ascension. Old Deuteronomy has buried nine wives. And more I am tempted to say ninety-nine. And his numerous progeny prospers and thrives. And the village is proud of him in his decline. At the sight of that placid and bland physiognomy. When he sits in the sun on the vicarage wall, the oldest inhabitant croaks, Well, of all things, can it be, really? No, oh, yes. Oh, hi, oh, my eye. My mind may be wandering, but I confess, I believe it is old Deuteronomy. Old Deuteronomy sits in the street. He sits in the high street on market day. The bullocks may bellow, the sheep may, they may bleat. The dogs and the herdsmen will turn them away. Cars and the lorries run over the curb, and the villagers put up a notice, road closed, so that nothing untoward may chance to disturb Deuteronomy's rest when he feels so disposed, or when he's engaged in domestic economy, and the oldest inhabitant croaks, Well, of all things, can it really be? No, yes, oh, hi, oh, my eye, my sight unreliable, but I can guess that the cause of the trouble is old Deuteronomy. Old Deuteronomy lies on the floor, with the fox and French horn for his afternoon sleep. And when the men say, just time for one more, then the landlady from her back parlor will peep and say, Now then, out you go, by the back door, for old Deuteronomy mustn't be woken. I'll have the police if there's any uproar. And out they all shuffle, without a word spoken, digest the digestive repose of that feline's gastronomy must never be broken. Whatever befall, and the old inhabitant croaks, Well, of all things, can it be? Really? Yes, no. Oh, hi, oh, my eye, my legs may be tottery. I must go slow and be careful of Deuteronomy. Of the awful battle of the peaks and the pollicles, together with some account of the participation of the pugs and the palms, and the intervention of the great rumpus cat. The peaks and the pollicles, everyone knows, are proud, implacable, passionate foes. It's always the same wherever one goes. And the pugs and the palms, although me most people say that they do not like fighting, yet once in a way, they will now and again join in the fray, and they bark, 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 until you can hear them all over the park. Now on the occasion of which I shall speak, almost nothing had happened for nearly a week. That's a long time for a pole or a pick peak. The big police dog was away from his beat. I don't know the reason, but most people think he slipped into the Wellington Arms for a drink. And no one all at all was about on the street when a peak and pollicle happened to meet. They did not advance or exactly retreat, but they glared at each other and scraped their hind feet and started to bark, 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 till you could hear them all over the park. Now the peak, although people may say what they please, is no British dog but a heathen Chinese. And so all the peaks, when they heard the uproar, some came to the window, some came to the door. There were surely a dozen, more likely a score. And together they snorted to grumble and wheeze in their huffery, stuthery, heathen Chinese. But a terrible din is what pollicles like. For your pollicle dog is a dour Yorkshire tyke. 
and his bra Scottish cousins are snappers and biters, and every jo da do and every dog jack of them notable fighters, and when they stepped out with their pipers in order, played when the blue bonnets come over the border, then the pugs and the palms held no longer aloof, but some from the balcony, some from the roof, joined in to the din with a bark, 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 bark till you could hear them all over the park. Now when these bold heroes together assembled, the traffic all stopped and the underground trembled. And some of the neighbors were so much afraid that they started to ring up the fire brigade, when suddenly up from a small basement flat, who should stalk out but the great rumpus cat? His eyes were like fireballs fearfully blazing. He gave a great yawn and his jaws were amazing. And when he looked out through the bars of the area, you never saw anything fiercer or hairier. And what with the glare of his eyes and his yawning, the peaks and the pollocks quickly took warning. He looked at the sky and he gave a great leap. And they, every last one of them, scattered like sheep. And when the police dog returned to his beat, there wasn't a single one left in the street. And a drink. Mr. Mistopheles, you ought to know Mr. Mistopheles, the original conjuring cat. There can be no doubt about that. Please listen to me and don't scoff. All his inventions are off his own back. There's no such cat in the metropolis. He holds all the patent monopolies for performing surprising illusions and creating eccentric confusions. At prestidigitation and at Letter Germain, he'll defy examination and deceive you again. The greatest magicians have something to learn from Mr. Mistopheles' conjuring turn. Presto, away we go, and we all say, oh, well, I never was there ever a cat so clever as magical Mr. Mistopheles. He is quiet and small. He is black from his ears to the tip of his tail. He can creep through the tiniest crack. He can walk on the narrowest rail. He can pick any card from a pack. He is equally cunning with dice. He is always deceiving you into believing that he's only hunting for mice. He can play any trick with a cork or spoon and a bit of fish paste. You look for a knife or a fork. You think it merely displaced. You have seen it one moment and then it is gone. But you'll never see it, find it next week lying out on the lawn. And will say, oh, well, I never was there ever a cat so clever as magical Mr. Mistopheles. His manner is vague and aloof would think there was nobody shyer, but his voice has been heard on the roof when he's curled up by the fire, and he's sometimes been heard by the fire. He was about on the roof. At least we all heard that somebody heard, which is incontestable proof of his singular magical powers, and I have known the family to call him in the gar from the garden for hours while he was asleep in the hall, and not long ago this phenomenal cat produce seven kittens right out of a hat, and we all said, oh, well, I never did you ever know a cat so clever as magical Mr. Mistopheles. McCavity, the Mystery Cat McCavity's a mystery cat. He's called the Hidden Paw, for he's the master criminal who can defy the law. He's the bafflement of Scotland Yard, the flying squad's despair, for when they reach this scene of crime, McCavity's not there. McCavity, McCavity, there's no one like McCavity. He's broken every human law. He breaks the law of gravity. His powers of levitation would make a fakir stare. And when you reach the scene of the crime, McCavity's not there. You may seek him in the basement, you may look up in the air. But I tell you once and once again, McCavity's not there. McCavity's a ginger cat, very tall and thin. You would know him if you saw him, for his eyes are sunken in. In. His brow is deeply lined with thought. His head is highly doved. His coat is dusty from neglect. Whiskers are uncombed. 
sways his head from side to side with movements like a snake. When you think he's half asleep, he's always wide awake. McCavity, McCavity, there's no one like McCavity, for he's a fiend in feline shape, a monster of depravity. You may meet him in a by street, you may see him in the square, but when a crime's discovered, then McCavity's not there. He's outwardly respectable, they say he cheats at cards. And his footprints are not found in any file at Scotland Yards. And when the larder's looted, or the jewel case is rifled, when the milk is missing, or another peak's been stifled, or the greenhouse glass is broken, and the trellis past repair, aye, there's the wonder of the thing, but cavity's not there. And when the foreign office find a treaty guns astray, or the admiralty loses some plans and drawings by the way, there may be a scrap of paper in all the hall or on the stair, but it's useless to investigate. The cavity's not there. And when the loss has been disclosed, the Secret Service say it must have been McCavity, but he's a mile away. You'll be sure to find him resting or a licking of his thumbs or engaged in doing complicated long division sums. Cavity, McCavity, there's no one like McCavity. Or... There never was a cat of such deceitfulness and suavity. He's always had a, has an alibi and one or two to spare. And whatever time the deed took place, McCavity wasn't there. And they say that all the cats whose wicked deeds are widely known, I might mention Mungo Jerry, I might mention Criddlebone, are nothing more than agents for the cat who all the time just controls their operations, the Napoleon of crime. Gus, the theater cat. Gus is the cat at the theater door. His name, as I ought to have told you before, is really Asparagus. That's such a fuss. To pronounce that we usually call him just Gus. His coat's very shabby, he's thin as a rake. He suffers from palsy that makes his paw shake. Yet he has, in his youth, quite the smartest, quite the smartest of cats, but no longer a terror to mice and to rats. For he isn't the cat that he was in his prime, Though his name was quite famous, he says in its time, and whenever he joins his friend at their club, which takes place at the back of the neighboring pub, he loves to regale them if someone else pays, with anecdote drawn from his palmiest days, for he once was a star of the highest degree. He has acted with Irving, he's acted with Cree. He likes to re re relate his, ac his success on the halls, where the galley once gave him seven cat calls. But his grandest creation, as he loves to tell, was fire for a fiddle, the fiend of the fell. I have played, so he says, every possible part, and I used to know seventy speeches by heart. I'd extemporize back chat. I knew how to gag. I knew how to let out, let the cat out of the bag. I knew how to act with my back and my tail. With an hour of rehearsal, I never could fail. I had a voice that would soften the hardest of hearts. Never I took the lead or a character parts. I'd have set by the bedside of poor little Nell when the curfew was rung and I swung on the bell. In the pantomime season I never fell flat, and I once understood, understudied Dick Whittington's cat. But my finest creation, as history will tell, was Fire Fro Fiddle, the fiend of the fell. Then if someone will give him a toothful grin, a toothful of gin, he will tell how he once played a part in East Line. At a Shakespeare performance, he once walked on Pat. When some actor suggested the need for a cat, he once played a tiger. But do it again, which an Indian colonel pursued down a train. And he thinks that he still can, much better than most, produce blood-curdling noises to bring on the ghost. And he once crossed the stage on a telegraph wire to rescue a child when, the house was, when a house was on fire. And he says, now these kittens, they do not get trained, as we did in the days when Victoria reigned. They never get drilled in a regular troop, and they think they're, they are smart, just jump through a hoop. And he'll say, as he scratches himself with his paws, well, the theater's certainly not what it was. These modern productions are all very well, but there's nothing to equal, from what I can tell, the moment of mystery, when I made history as fire for fiddle, the fiend of the fell. Bustopher Jones, the Cat About Town. 
Fustiber Jones is not skin and bones. In fact, he's remarkably fat. He doesn't haunt pubs. He has eight or nine clubs. For he's the St. James Street Cat. The cat we all greet as he walks down the street in his coat of fastidious black. No commonplace mousers have such well-cut trousers or such an impeccable back. In the whole of St. James, the smartest of names is the name of this Brummel of cats, and we're all of us proud to be nodded or bowed to by, Brus by Bustopher Jones in, his in white spats. His visits are occasional to this senior educational, and it is against the rules for any one cat to belong both to that and the joint superior schools. For a similar reason, when game is in session, he is found not at Fox, but Blimps. He is frequently seen at the, at the gay stage and screen, which is famous for winkles and shrimps. In the season of venison, he gives his benson to the pot hunter's succulent bones. And just before noon's not a moment too soon to drop in for a drink at the drones. When he's seen in a hurry, there's probably curry at the Siamese or at the glutton. If he looks full of gloom, then he's lunched at the tomb, on cabbage, rice pudding, and mutton. So much in this way past Bustopher's day, at one club or another he's found, it can be no surprise that under our eyes he has grown unmistakably round. He's a twenty-five pounder, or I am a bounder, and he's putting on weight every day, but he's so well preserved because he's observed all his life's a routine, so, so he'll say, or to put it in rhyme, I shall last out my time, is the word of his stout of the stoutest of cats. It must and it shall be spring in Pall Mall, while Bustopher Jones wears white spats. Gimbleshanks, the Railway Cat There's a whisper down the line at 11.39, when the night mall's ready to depart, saying, Skimble, where is Skimble? Has he gone to hunt the thimble? We must find him, or the train can't start. All the guards and all the porters and station masters, master's daughters, they are searching high and low, saying, Skimble, where is Skimble? Or unless he's very nimble, then the night mail just can't go. At 11.42, then the signal's nearly due, and the passengers are frantic to a man. Then Skimble will appear, and he'll saunter to the rear. He's been, bigot, he's been busy in the luggage van. He gives one flash of his glass-green eyes, the signal goes all clear. We're off at last for the northern part of the northern hemisphere. You may say that by and large it is Skibble, Skimble who is in charge of the sleeping car express. From the driver and the guard to the bagman playing cards, he'll supervise them all more or less. Down the corridor he paces and examines all the faces of the travelers in the first and in the third. He establishes control by a regular patrol, and he'd know at once if anything occurred will watch you without winking, and he sees what you are thinking, and it's certain that he doesn't approve of hilarity and riot, so, so, so the folk are very quiet when Skimble is about, and can play no pranks with Skimble's shanks. He's a cat that cannot be ignored, so nothing goes wrong on the northern mail when Skimble shanks is aboard. Oh, it's very pleasant when you have found your little den, with your name written up on the door. And the berth is very neat, with a newly folded sheet. There's not a speck of dust on the floor. There is every sort of light you can make it in dark or bright. There's a handle that you turn to make a breeze. There's a funny little basin you're supposed to wash your face in, and a crank to shut the window if you sneeze. Then the guard looks in politely and will ask you very brightly, Do you like your morning tea, weak or strong? But Skimble is just behind him and was ready to remind him, or Skimble won't do anything won't let anything go wrong, but when you creep into your cozy berth, pull up the counterpane, ought to reflect that's, that it's very nice to know that you won't be bothered by mice. You can leave all that to the railway cat, cat of the railway train. In the watches of the night, he is always fresh and bright. Every now and then he has a cup of tea, with perhaps a drop of scotch while he's keeping on the watch, only stopping here and there to catch a flea. You were fast fast asleep at crew, and so you never knew that he was walking up and down the station. You were sleeping all the while. He was busy at Carlisle, where he greets the station, station master with elation. But you saw him at Dumfries, where he speaks to the police. If there's anything they ought to know about, when you get to 
Galloway Gate. There you have not to wait. For Skimble Shanks will get you to get out. Gives you a wave of his long brown tail, which says, Till you see again, you'll meet without fail on the midnight mail. Pet of the railway train. Virgil, have you thought of a... Um... Uh, not really. I have, um, thought sometimes maybe about if I might want to upload some stuff to you. Um, so, it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely, I should definitely look, think through. Um, about potential, probably definitely be the yeah. last one. Okay, the last poem: the the addressing of cats. You've re read of several kinds of cat, and my opinion now is that you should need no interpreter to understand their character now have learned enough to see that cats are much like you and me and other people whom we find possessed of various types of mind for some are sane and some are mad and some are good and some are bad and some are better some are worse but all may be described in verse you've seen them them both at work in games and learnt about their proper names their habits and their habitat but now how would you address a cat so first your memory I'll, jo I'll jog, and say a cat is not a dog. Now dogs pretend they like to fight, but often bark, more seldom bite. But yet a dog is, on the whole, what you would call a simple soul. Of course I'm not including peaks, and such fantastic canine freaks. The usual dog about the town is much inclined to, much inclined to play the clown, and far from showing too much pride, is, frequ is frequently undignified. He's very easily taken in. Just chuck him on underneath the chin. Or slap his back or shake his paw, and he will gamble and guffaw. He's such an easy-going lout, he'll answer any hail or shout. Again, I must remind you that a dog's a dog, a cat's a cat. Cats, some say, one rule is true. Don't speak till you are spoken to. Myself, I do not hold with that. I say you should address a cat. But always keep in mind that he resents familiarity. I bow, and taking off my hat, address him in this form. O oh, cat! But if, he is in, but if he is the cat next door, whom I have often met before, he comes to see me in my flat. I greet him with an, oops, a cat. I think I've heard him call him James, but we've not got so far as names. Before a cat will condescend to treat you as a trusted friend. Some little token of esteem is needed, like a dish of cream. And you might now and then supply some caviar or Strasbourg pie, some spotted grouse or salmon salmon paste. He's sure to have his personal taste. I know a cat who makes a habit of eating nothing else but rabbit. When he's finished, licks his paws, so not to waste the onion sauce. A cat's entitled to expect. There's evidences of respect. So in time you reach your aim, Finally call him by his name. So this is this, and that is that. And there's how you address a cat. End of Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats by T.S. Eliot.